Okay, thank you, Chandra. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the School on Black Holes and Gravitational Waves. Uh, we have Professor Sanjeev Durender giving his second lecture on basics of gravitational waves. Uh, maybe what we can do is that there were some questions towards the end of uh, Professor Durender's lecture yesterday. If you wish, you can raise your hand and ask the questions, and then I can request Professor uh, Durender to continue from where he left off. Are there any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this stage, Sanji. Well, okay. um, again, uh, yeah, but can I request you to start? Yeah. Sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, yesterday we had come to this gauge transformation. And uh, we had talked about this Lorentz gauge. And it's basically Lorentz gauges because uh, we are a family of gauges. And the freedom is here. And that because uh, you can add zeta mu to xi mu and still retain that earlier thing. Xi, box xi mu equal to this equation. Even if you add xi mu, theta mu to xi mu, if the box of xi mu and theta mu is zero, so it's a solution a solution to the wave equation, homogeneous wave equation. So in this case, uh, so if you add any such thing, so it's a large amount of freedom which is there, and uh, one can in fact exploit it. So here the gauge is not fixed by the Lorentz uh, uh, condition which uh, we have imposed h mu nu h bar mu nu comma nu equal to zero that was the thing so it is exactly like uh, i'm uh, draw, pa drawing parallels with electrodynamics a mu comma mu is zero is also a lorentz gauge condition in electrodynamics and that also does not fix the gauge so that is just there are four components and it's just one relation between them divergence of a plus one by c d5 by dt is zero okay so you can you can continue to fix the gauge, and I think we will do that uh, if it is so required. Probably in quantum field theory and all that, where you uh, need, uh, I mean, you don't want extra degrees of freedom and things. So here, of course, our purpose is we are not doing any quantum stuff. The here the purpose is to simply to simplify the situation and write the whole. HV new tensor or the gravitational metric tensor, the perturbation in the simplest possible form. So that's the basic idea. So we will consider plane wave solutions. Now these are the most uh, uh, useful or uh, most useful uh, astrophysically because all the sources are pretty far away. And the waves which come to us, you know, uh, even if they are spherical when they start from there, those waves, they become uh, the, the the surface or the uh, the surface of the wave become uh, is approximately a plane. So these are basically plane wave solutions that we will look at. So vacuum solutions. So we will look at vacuum solutions. Uh, so this is just propagation. So they have left the source and they are now propagating this. Along. So in that case, what is the situation? So box H bar mu nu is zero in that case. So that is the, I think if you go back somewhere, ah, this was the thing here. You have put T mu nu equal to zero. So we have box H bar mu nu equal to zero. That is, we have uh, eta alpha beta uh, H bar mu nu comma alpha beta is equal to zero. So this is, that is what is box. The eta alpha beta has got a minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So it is minus uh, diver square by diver t square, one over c square, plus uh, uh, del square. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of thing, which uh, that's the operator, eta alpha beta, and something comma uh, alpha beta. 
so this is the uh, so this is the wave equation and the plane wave solutions to this are the following that if you can write h bar mu nu equal to a mu nu e to the i k alpha x alpha okay so a mu nu here are constants okay and k alpha is the wave vector it's called the wave vector and uh, x alpha is are simply the coordinates okay so it is just the usual thing so if i write k alpha is so just the phase if you take the phase is k alpha x alpha and i expand this phase in the usual way k alpha x alpha is eta alpha beta k alpha x beta which is minus k naught x naught plus So this is the usual kind of thing you have also in electrodynamics. You write, you know, this E, the electric field E bar equal to E naught into I uh, K dot R minus I omega T. And that's exactly what uh, we have written here also for this way. And A, B, and U are constants and they could be complex. And that complex, uh, we allow them to be complex also uh, because that could add the, to, to the phase and things like that. But A mu nu is symmetric. As you can see that H mu nu has to be symmetric or H bar mu nu. So A mu nu has to be symmetric. The wave vector is K alpha equal to omega by C K. K alpha is this. And so this is the <coughs> wave vector. So this represents a plane wave traveling in the K direction. <coughs> so now <coughs> the wave equation in fact uh, imposes conditions on the k so that's what we will see what what sorry i have to drop this yeah so h alpha h bar alpha so i keep on differentiating I want to get that h bar mu nu comma alpha beta. So h bar mu nu comma alpha is just i k alpha h bar mu nu. If, I, if you assume this kind of uh, this kind of a form of the solution, h bar mu nu is a mu nu into e to the i k alpha x alpha. Then h bar mu nu comma alpha beta <coughs> will bring in another factor of i k beta down okay so <clears throat> that will make it minus k alpha k beta into h bar mu nu so box h bar mu nu is, is eta alpha beta h bar mu nu comma alpha beta minus eta alpha beta times k alpha k beta h bar mu nu and this is equal to zero so this implies since h bar mu nu is a sort of arbitrary this is uh, it implies that eta alpha beta k alpha k beta is equal to zero. That means the length of this vector, the whole length of this vector is zero. It's a null vector. Okay, so that is k alpha k alpha is zero or k alpha is a null vector. It lies on the light code. Okay. And <clears throat> we will be talking of and it will be future light code because in any case, I mean, we'll be considering ways which are traveling forward to the future. So what this tells you immediately that GWs travel the speed of light, okay, or speed C or the speed of light. So this is in general relativity. Then we have the Lorentz condition. The Lorentz condition is H bar mu nu comma nu equal to zero. That tells you A mu nu k nu is zero, okay. So that implies A mu nu k nu is zero. That means GW, the gravitational waves are also transverse to this thing. Okay, so that so that that's also three. So it's this this kind of a theory, okay, of the linearized gravity or linearized or even uh, wave solutions are very close to the uh, Maxwell kind of situation, where you have the same kind of situation that the electromagnetic waves travel with the speed of light. In fact, they are light. So 
we must travel with so it's sort of a tautology and uh, other thing is that there are also transfers the electric field and the magnetic field are transfers uh, they are uh, orthogonal to the direction of propagation this however does not exhaust okay now coming back to gravitation waves so i'll be drawing this analogy for some time with uh, electromagnetic waves because those are the kind of things which uh, with which you are familiar and so uh, you can make the connection more uh, easily this however does not exhaust the gauge degrees of freedom because we can still remain within the lorentz gauge by choosing as i said xi prime mu equal to xi mu plus zeta mu uh, such that box of xi mu is zero box of zeta mu is zero so let's see what you can do with this so choose again a solution here zeta mu equal to b mu into e to the i k alpha x alpha okay so b mu is again a constant then you go back to the uh, how <coughs> what happens in a when you do a gauge transformation what is h bar mu nu how it is it related to the newly transformed in the gauge transformed uh, h bar mu nu so you go back uh, i think here is the thing here h bar uh, mu nu is this this particular quantity here okay so h bar this minus this is this so this is what we are using so when we use this what you get is uh, you will get a zeta mu zeta mu and all this sort of thing and which gives if you write h prime mu nu equal to a prime mu nu e to the i k alpha x alpha then a prime mu nu is a mu nu and you can just uh, identify terms and uh, you can get this kind of a uh, this kind of a situation here a prime mu nu is a mu nu minus i b mu k nu minus i b nu k mu plus i Uh, eta mu nu b alpha k alpha see what we need to do is we have to solve for actually b mu if such a gauge has to exist okay so then so that will show that you can have such a gauge now that i am not going to do here probably it will be done more generally in a, in the tutorial probably this afternoon or something like that i don't think there was a tutorial yesterday uh, Maybe there there is one today. So, yes, Sanjeev. Yeah, there is one today. Yeah. So this will be done in the tutorial, uh, and even more uh, more generally, okay, in this thing. And and so now, if I take now, you can just check. I mean, this is just a check that you are still remaining within the uh, Lorentz gauges. Uh, <clears throat> you just uh, multiply a prime mu nu k nu. Then this is simply an identity. Then this is equal to a mu. So if uh, uh, if the uh, if uh, I mean h bar mu nu, for example, is in the Lorentz gauge, then h bar prime mu nu by doing this still remains within the Lorentz gauge. So h a prime mu nu k nu equal to a mu nu k nu minus this, but this is zero anyway because of the fact that We are in the Lorentz gauge. It is already there. That is the top there. And then this is k nu k nu. This is a null vector, so this is zero. Then there is i b nu k nu and so on. These two terms, in fact, uh, cancel out because this term is the same as this term. This eta mu nu will bring this down, and these are uh, have opposite signs. So this is an identity. In fact, this is equal to zero. So what this shows that it's not surprising that. <coughs> that uh, we are we remain inside the lorentz gauge that's all the, that's all that we have checked so now we come to the transverse trace stress gauge so this is the first thing that uh, uh, you have this a prime mu nu and so on equal to zero and you make this kind of uh, uh, you know, i mean you can make this kind of transformations uh, or use this kind of gauges and b mu nu is a hand so you can choose that 
in in a way that you can satisfy you can make the edge bar mu nu tensor better or simpler so additional gauge freedom allows us to choose that so this is what i'm going to state here a mu mu is equal to zero that is it's trace free and the other thing is for any time line vector u mu we may choose a mu nu u nu equal to zero so there are a whole lot of these conditions you can use the rest of the gauge freedom that is this box uh, zeta uh, zeta mu nu where is that zeta mu here this can be used to actually uh, <coughs> make these things make your a uh, make a trace free as well as make it orthogonal to a given time like vector u mu so this will reduce the number of degrees of freedom of the thing so generally physically what one does is that you choose u mu to be the uh, four velocity so this is a time like vector u mu is probably usually chosen to be unit and it is uh, u mu u nu is equal to uh, uh, minus 1 i guess in this case is that with this uh, signature and uh, then uh, so this can be just the uh, tangent or uh, the four velocity of the observer or it may be the detector you can choose the u mu to be the four velocity of the detector and uh, so this would be in fact the u mu which is there so what you get is uh, these things which are there and already we have the lorentz condition a mu nu k nu is equal to 0 okay so now we can't assume that such things can automatically happen you know i mean the thing is that can, can such a thing happen for any given k any particular direction of the gravitational wave i'll show this that this, this will happen for a uh, wave traveling the z direction the in tutorial you see that you can do this for any direction and you will take a the i think mukesh or the tutor who is there he will take a general direction some space direction n say n i and if you have a wave traveling in that uh, general direction n i then also the, these things can be done so we must show that such as i mu exists and we must solve for b mu only then we are through okay otherwise uh, i mean it doesn't mean make sense so this is the tutorial so i have kept all the hard part in the tutorial and i am sort of doing the easier part okay, in those things <laughs> so but the point is that these conditions are not independent okay there is one condition among them so that condition is a mu nu u nu k nu is zero so even even if you see for example a mu nu k nu is zero what it tells you is that a mu nu if you regard it as a matrix it has a zero eigen value so there exists a vector uh, k nu which is a eigen vector with eigen value zero so what this means is that a mu nu is suddenly not of rank 4 so we are in four dimensions so it's not of rank 4 it is less than rank 4 and what is the rank? We will see that it is going to turn out to be 2. But uh, right now you can see that it's suddenly not 4. So, so these are actually three independent conditions. So when you have a mu nu like this, there are only three linearly independent row vectors in a nu. <coughs> and so even if you put conditions, <coughs> a mu nu u nu equal to 0, that gives you only three conditions so three plus four plus one so three coming from four coming from a mu nu k nu equal to zero which you had in the beginning a mu nu u nu equal to zero is three plus one which is the trace free condition okay so that gives you eight or one can write it like this sanji why is a mu nu u nu equal to zero only three conditions which one? Uh, sorry. Uh, you mean a mu nu u nu equal to 0? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, so three independent conditions. Because uh, it is a uh, rank 3, at least below rank 3 matrix. 
it's not the rank 4. The row vectors of uh, A are linearly, they are not linearly independent, they are linearly dependent. The reason is because A mu nu can you is 0 with the 0 eigenvalue and okay. K is the eigenvector. So, this itself tells you that there is a vector to which A mu nu is orthogonal, <coughs> which means all the ve <coughs> four vectors are orthogonal to this K. Okay. So, that, that can only happen, I mean, if uh, only three of them, I mean, minimum three of them or maximum three of them are linearly independent. So, <coughs> so these are just three conditions. I, I don't know whether I have <coughs> made this clear. You will see it when I do an explicit example. I'll make a, I'll, I'll do an explicit example where I take can you the wave traveling along the z-axis. Then you can actually see, solve for things and look at what happens in that case. Is that clear or it will become clear anyway? Okay. Yes, Sanjay. Yeah. Oh, just one minute. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so this is the thing. So there are eight independent conditions on 10 A mu nu's. 10 because, because A mu nu is a four cross four matrix, you can look at it, but it is symmetric. So there are 10 components. So that, uh, I mean, if you uh, reduce it because of the symmetry, but there are now eight conditions on this 10 components. So there are eight independent conditions on this uh, thing. So A mu nu has just two independent components, and these are the physical degrees of freedom of the gravitation wave. Okay, so that's what it is, and these are the two polarizations, plus and cross. Okay, of the way we will we'll see why they are called plus and cross as we uh, go along. So th that is the that is the first thing. So this is somewhat abstract here because I have. Uh, I skipped a lot of steps. Okay, so that's the that's the reason why this is uh, it may not look so this thing. Uh, you can see Mr. Thorne and Wheeler also does something like this. Uh, but I think in the tutorial, uh, these things will be done uh, much more carefully. In fact, I'll do it now for the for a for a special case of K nu, uh, say uh, for a wave traveling in the z direction. And you'll see how this works. So, <clears throat> physically, you choose, you, you can be chosen to be the four velocity of the observer or detector by going to the appropriate Lorentz frame. Okay. So, u mu is just one zero zero zero. Uh, that is u mu. Or u mu is just delta mu zero. Okay, so you can write it in a short like that. But this in turn implies, so if you look at this condition, A mu nu, u nu equal to zero, if you put delta uh, nu zero, it implies that uh, A mu zero is zero. So all the zero components are zero. So the zeroth row and also the zeroth column because of the symmetry are zero. So it becomes completely spatial. Okay. So the whole tensor, so all the time components of A, A simply go away. They become zero in this gauge. <clears throat> so now what I'm saying is that also rotate the frame so that K points in the Z direction. Okay. So K mu is now along minus omega C, zero, zero, omega C. This is what now K mu looks like because there are no X, Y components now to this. Then, what happens is that a mu nu k nu equal to zero. Now you use this condition. This will give you a mu zero omega, so k zero, plus a mu z kz equal to zero. 
but a mu zero is anyway zero. So it, it tells you a mu z times omega by c is zero, which means a mu z is zero. Is it clear? I mean, so what I'm saying here. So now, so all the z, uh, all the things which are on the third axis, okay, on the third dimension, which is the z direction, they are also zero. So which tells you that it, it just gives you the transversality of the wave. So you are taking a wave traveling in the z direction, but the field components, if you look at it, are all in xy plane. Your axx, axy, axy, axx, and so on. Axy, ayy. So what then? So then, att. This is called a transverse traceless gauge. Okay. So we are transverse because, as you can see, it is transverse. It is transverse to the, these things. Now, actually, you can go back now and look at this. What is happening? See here, you are getting only. It is actually a second rank matrix. I had said that. Just doing this k nu a mu nu uh, k nu equal to zero will give you a a mu will, will make a mu a mu nu a matrix with a rank less than four. So it could be three, two, one. We don't know. But it it's not three also because there's a mu nu u nu is zero. And in fact, if you look at these things, u nu is time like while k nu is null and these two vectors have to be linearly independent because one is time-like and one is not. Okay, so one lies on the light core while the other one lies inside it. So if a mu nu is orthogonal to both of them, then uh, there are two separate conditions. Okay, so which makes things makes only two rows of a mu nu uh, independent. Okay, or at least uh, uh, the linear dependence is there. Uh, there are two linearly dependent, uh, linear dependence conditions on a mu. The row vectors are not simply uh, independent. So, so this is what you end up with. So you got uh, a mu z is zero. So again, because of symmetry, the column, the z column is zero, and the z row is zero. So what remains is only the center piece there in x5 so axx axy ayx and uh, ayy now you apply symmetry symmetry is there so a axy is the same as ayx and uh, you and and it was be trace free also now apply the trace free condition so axx plus ayy should be zero so which means that this component ayy should be equal to minus axx. So this matrix looks like this. att mu nu axx axy axy minus axx. So we write, okay, so this is the basic transverse stateless gauge for a wave traveling in the z direction. Okay. So we write axx as a plus, so that's the notation uh, which is introduced by Kip Thorne and axy as a cos and h plus as a plus into e to the i k alpha x alpha etc and we can in fact write the transverse traceless uh, perturbation the metric perturbation h mu nu h mu nu right tt is h plus e plus e mu nu plus h cross e cross u nu e mu nu where E plus and E cross are the polarization tensors. So what are those polarization tensors? Here they are. So this is how the whole thing looks like. So is this all right? I can go over it again if uh, this is a little bit fast. But uh, the point is that this sort of thing, I think, uh, will be again done in the tutorial, I guess, to some extent. So any questions up to here? I mean, this is something. Yeah. Are there any questions, students? Please just raise your hand or leave a question in the chat, and or rather in the question and answer. 
but are not at this stage, Sanjeev. Okay. The polarizations can have uh, can have a phase difference between them, which is realized by the fact that A plus and A cross. Uh, so here is the thing. Here we have polarization tensors. Okay. So in case of electrodynamics, there was a polarization vectors. Okay. Like if you have a wave, so again, drawing an analogy with the electromagnetic wave, say traveling the Z direction, then the, there are two polarization vectors, linear polarization vectors, say X and Y. So you have EX and EY. Those are the two versions of the electromagnetic wave. Okay. And the E, which will come with it. So, but those are polarization vectors here. In this case, these are tensors, okay? And because this is a tensor wave. The polarizations can have a phase difference between them, just as you can have the same thing in electrodynamics. <coughs> and uh, you know, phase difference between them, which is realized by the fact that A plus and A cross can be complex quantities. So the phases can be accommodated in the phases of the complex numbers. So that's very, uh, that's one of the usefulness of using complex numbers. The complex numbers uh, do this thing very efficiently and compactly that you can, phases can be automatically included in the, in the, in the, in the, <coughs> in the amplitudes and so on. And uh, the whole physical description can be given pretty well. Okay, superposition of waves of different frequencies. So for a wave coming from a fixed direction and observer detected at the origin say R equal to zero, by taking the inverse Fourier transform with respect to omega, the HS become a function of time. So, so if you take uh, <coughs> waves with different frequencies but traveling the same fixed direction, then uh, the same kind of uh, the same TT gauge works, all these things. And for example, so we can uh, sum up uh, those uh, components, Fourier components, and make up the wave in the time domain. For example, if we just consider the plus polarization uh, here, then uh, plus polarization is which? The 2.5, that is the pl plus polarization, one minus one here. You can, I could have taken cross also, which is this one, one here. So here what happens is that, this is uh, what happened now here. Wait, what, some other I have. Why did I, huh. Maybe I skipped something, isn't it? Oh, I skipped one slide in between. That's why. <laughs> I wondered why that slide came. Anyway, so wave traveling in the general direction Ni, consider a wave propagating in the general spatial direction Ni. The polarization tensors are rotated by the relevant rotation matrices. Okay? And the polarization tensors are orthogonal in the sense that their scalar product is zero. So E plus mu nu, E cross mu nu is zero. It is just like your X and Y uh, uh, you know, polarizations for electric field, for example, if you are uh, magnetic field, there also you take two of these vectors which are orthogonal, two states which are uh, uh, in which are orthogonal, which is uh, much easier to work with. You don't end up with mess of you know cross terms and things. So here you have e plus mu nu, e cross mu nu is equal to zero. So we conveniently and easily obtain GW strain in the TT gauge by an algebraic projection. So this is again in the tutorial. Uh, see the, the thing here. It see, it would seem that it's a, it seems a rather tedious job, you know, to go to the TT gauge using xi mu and so on. Okay, uh, you must get the xi mu, get the mu, b mu, and uh, so on. I mean, and then. Uh, see what what is the h bar uh, prime mu nu that you get okay well, that is the htt but all this thing can be cut short and uh, there is a quicker way of doing this 
And this is just by an algebraic projection. So we conveniently and easily obtain the GW strain in the TT gauge, okay, uh, by an algebraic pro projection, which is uh, uh, for a wave traveling in the direction NI. Define the projection operator to be this thing. So you have this kind of thing here. So these are orthogonal to each other, and here you can obtain uh, uh, conveniently easy to obtain the GW strain in the TT gauge by an algebraic projection. And what is this projection operator? I mean, we can do this algebraically. Okay? So you don't have to do this analytically. Okay, And this can be done. And again, it's in the tutorial. So there is a long calculation which you can see. Here also you have to show that such a B mu exists, that B mu which was there. See this psi mu wherever wherever it was. Yeah, zeta mu, we must show that such uh, zeta mu exists and we must solve for B mu. So it's exactly the kind of thing that has to be done here. And one can solve and uh, get the HTT in a very, uh, very subtle and a very nice form uh, without actually doing a lot of work. So we can save on a lot of uh, uh, what you call analytic calculations if we use this kind of a projection operator. For a wave traveling in the NI direction, define the projection operator to be PI equal to delta IJ minus NI IJ. So why is this a projection operator? Because if I multiply, so what is a projection operator? So it projects to a lower dimension, okay? So this is projecting from three dimensions to uh, two dimensional subspace orthogonal to Ni. Okay, or it's a two plane. Okay, it projects to a plane whose normal uh, normal is n. Okay, and you can see that by actually using the uh, algebraic properties of Pij. If you take Pij, Pjk, it is equal to Pik. So P squared is P. What's the projection operator? If you multiply, I mean, if you operate again with the projection operator, you don't get anything new. You get the same thing because you have already done the job, okay, of projecting certain quantity onto some space, okay. And if you and there's no point in applying another again another projection operator because you'll be just wasting time. It'll uh, you'll get the same thing again, okay. So this is uh, so that way you can check that. That the PIJ, PJK today is PIK. So that is one of the things there. And its projects orthogonal to NI. Okay, that also can be seen. So if you take a vector which is orthogonal to a, NI, it will project to zero. Okay. <clears throat> so if we have VI NI equal to zero, then PIJ VJ will be zero. Okay. So uh, so this is a projection operator which projects things onto a plane orthogonal to Ni. And you can see this very clearly that uh, uh, if you take, for example, N in the Z direction, as I've done earlier, then uh, N, Ni, this, what is this PIJ matrix? It is just, uh, Ni becomes just 1, 1 in the third. Ni, Nj will be just 1 in the third column and row and delta ij is a unit matrix so this is pij is the matrix 1 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 okay so it is just a projection uh, it projects the any vector to its xy component so just the x and y it projects any vector say along uh, I mean, in the play, you know, Euclidean space, say, uh, uh, some A with AX, AY, AZ to just uh, AXI plus AYG. Okay. Then HTT IG is given by this kind of thing. Okay. So this is the next kind of thing which you get here. And you get directly, you can get the TT gauge, uh, the H in the TT gauge. So HLM is anywhere. So this is a usually very useful 
because what happens is that you might calculate HLM in a convenient frame where it may be very, you may use whatever formula you may have to calculate the, uh, what do you call, the uh, metric perturbation or the wave HLM uh, coming from the source, but it may not be in the TT gauge. So then how do you bring it to the TT gauge? You just use this projection operator and immediately that goes to the TT gauge. P R P L I P M J and minus half P I J P L N. So this is basically subtracting out the trace. Okay. So this projects to the <coughs> projects HLM orthogonally to N, and then it subtracts out the trace. So that is what is basically uh, one can say with this uh, operation and get uh, the transverse trace part of H I J. Sanjeev, there is a question in the chat. Okay. It asks, what was the motivation behind choosing those additional gauge conditions in slide 23? Or where did the additional constraints come from? Uh, what? Uh, no, page I... slide 23. Ah, okay. The thing is that uh, they didn't come from anywhere. We put them. We choose it like this. So we have the freedom. We have a gauge freedom there, and we are just exploiting it. Okay, so we did not. If you don't, if you don't want to. Okay. So the point is that we have to make our calculations as simple as possible. That's the whole idea, and our expressions as simple as possible. Okay. So if you want to do that, then uh, reduce the number of components which you have in the. What is Plane going on this area. Uh, so, yeah, so what you want to do is you want to reduce the number of components here. So, what happens is that here you only have H plus and H cross. So, there are only two components to the H, okay, which is, of course, much better than having 10 components and, uh, you know, juggling with H of 10 of them. So, why do such a thing? So it's it's a question of basically you know uh, simplifying things and making things uh, efficient and when you things make make things more efficient you also uh, uh, what do you call <clears throat> I mean improve your understanding as to what is going on. Is that your answer? I believe. <clears throat> Can the perturbations? Uh, there is another question from a uh, Chinmai. Yeah. Uh, can perturbations have some form other than plane wave one as well? Yeah, they could. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, what we are considering is uh, sources. I mean, this is the astrophysical kind of thing, uh, which are very far from the Earth, for example. So they may be mega parsecs away. So things like. Uh, the binary black holes and things like that are 200 megaparsecs, 400 megaparsecs. That's the sort of distances. So, these are, so when they start from a particular source, which is an isolated source, they would start as spherical waves. But by the time they travel to us, they are basically playing. Okay. So, that's why we, so this is a physically important case, that's all. But you could have spherical waves. Thank you, Sanjeev. You yeah. can please proceed. But that is not of so much interest to us because uh, here I am concentrating more on the uh, useful days of this gravitation wave, these lectures to uh, astrophysics, actually, GW astronomy. So now we get to also superposition of uh, waves. Uh, so waves coming from a fixed direction and uh, observer and detector at origin r equal to zero by taking the inverse Fourier transform with respect to omega uh, you can simply add up all the Fourier components and get uh, h plus of t but you must have waves coming only from one direction okay? only then this sort of thing will work i think uh, there are papers on these things on this tt gauge and all that maybe i'll uh, Try and uh, you know 
give a set of references okay in which these things are there there is a <coughs> there is a paper by rocks <coughs> rac rac z okay and can we can what? we just request you to include in uh, at the end of your slides sanji yeah yeah so i did so i'll do that i'll send them uh sure. like, yeah uh it is uh, yeah and one thing is that uh, also these lectures are basically textbook lectures okay so uh, these kind of things you can find in uh, shoots book bernard shoots book is there there's a old book but uh, he has got second edition and now he has written a third edition also okay so there uh, you will find uh this kind of calculations and so on there is also mr thorn wheeler is the old book which is there there is mcgeor that also is a good book to look at uh, uh these kind of things so at least three books i know which are quite good to <coughs> quite good yes <coughs> yeah so okay so that clears my throat okay yeah so you can have superposition of waves but they have to be in the same direction and he insists that so there's a paper by rats r a c z something and probably somebody else also after that there are papers by ashtaker and bonga okay so which talk about the tt gauge and so on so maybe i'll send those references <clears throat> yeah now we come to the detection of uh, gravitation waves okay so this was basically the propagation which i have talked here so uh, this is the propagation in vacuum i have to think so then uh, now i will talk about more about the detection and uh, then uh, i'll go to the generation of gravitational waves okay so that will be the basically the quadrupole formula and i won't be going beyond the quadrupole formula or anything like that in this uh, lectures because uh, i thought these were supposed to be basic lectures so that's why i only uh, no no to there okay so detection of so now yeah so up to here uh, there are no questions or if there are any questions this is a different topic now i start on are there any questions students i don't see any other questions at this stage sanji kindly proceed okay so now we go to the detection of gravitational waves so what's the detection so the simplest thing here is uh, the geodesic deviation so first of all let me say this is a this is basically in some case a special case and it is what is called the long physically this is called the long wavelength limit okay lwl okay so in which case geodesic deviation gives you the answer very well okay <laughs> so which is true for ground based detectors so let me first do the geometry okay so this is to understand geodesic deviation so what you have here is the following thing that if you have geodesics okay <clears throat> in curves we start with the riemann tensor and you take uh, <coughs> a nearby geodesic and suppose they are parallel in the beginning <coughs> they will not remain parallel okay as you extend them okay and uh, so <coughs> and if they don't remain parallel that in fact is a sign of curvature <coughs> 
Okay. So that's the basic thing. So if there's a gravitational wave, the gravitational wave is going to create all perturbations uh, like this H mu u and so on. And if you take second derivatives and calculate the Riemann tensor, so the space time of gravitational wave is curved. So the geodesics, the world lines of particles, <coughs> will uh, follow geodesics. And the connecting vector between the geodesics will keep on changing. Okay. So let me start with geodesic deviation 2D. So this is a very simple thing here. This is for the uh, extremely, I mean, just the introduction. So that's why here. So I have taken three cases. Example of a plane, k equal to 0. Example of a sphere with k greater than 0. And again, I have come back to the same sphere and hyperboloid and hyperboloid of one sheet where k is less than zero. Okay. So as we saw that from the gauss body theorem, okay, that uh, <coughs> angles of a triangle over here add up to less than 180 degrees. So just to go back to that uh, particular theorem there, uh, <coughs> uh, gauss body theorem, Actually, there are, there are these external angles in this thing, which, uh, and that adds up. So I, I actually wanted to make some remarks on that. Maybe I'll go back to that. Where is it? Right. So going back to this gauss body theorem here is the Gaussian curvature and gauss body theorem is for geodesic triangles. So this is delta is, is a special case. But uh, the thing is that the actual cost body theorem is integral of this. So this integral is there. Plus there's another integral, which is the geodesic curvature along the triangle, okay, along this curve, which is zero in this case. And, but then there are <coughs> turning angles okay, as, as you go to the vertices. So immediately there are sharp turns here. So those will be picked up by the term integral kg ds, okay? And that is equal to two pi times the Euler characteristic. Now the Euler, so if you regard this as a manifold, the triangle itself. So one thing that you need is a compact two manifold, okay? It has to be compact. That means the sides of the triangle are included in the manifold. And this, when you take the integral, this is the integral over that, and you uh, integrate over the boundary of this thing. So what happens is that uh, when you have kg ds, the external angles uh, contribute in this thing. But we we are interested here this, in the inside, you know, internal triangles. But the internal triangles are pi minus the external angles. So if you take the sum in the thing, a plus b plus c, it is three pi minus the external angles. So that is what the next term will give you. And that should be equal to two pi times the Euler characteristic. But the Euler characteristic for the triangle is what? You can calculate this. There are three edges, three vertices. So E minus V is zero and one face. So chi is one. So that is equal to two pi. So three pi minus two pi gives you this pi. Okay, so which is, that's why you are getting this pi here from this thing. And one another comment I want to make about the gauss body theorem about is, is this is the robustness of this theorem. Okay, see this theorem here <coughs> uh, tells you that it is integral k ds and so on. If you take for a sphere, suppose you take a sphere for example as the thing here, then uh, the Euler characteristic for a sphere is two. In fact, so. <coughs> What this will give you is four pi. That everybody knows. Integral k is one over r square. So if you take ds here, the what you will get is integral k ds will be equal to four pi, and it is two pi times the Euler characteristic. So chi is two for a sphere. So it is it agrees. So there is no problem with the thing. So here it is fine. But the uh, thing is this this theorem is so. What do you call 
so robust i can uh, hammer the sphere okay with a hammer and dent it okay and make it anything of any shape but not break it in any way okay even if i dent it this will hold integral of k dot k and all that will change k might become negative positive it will be uh, because of the dent okay might become positive negative or it will change it will not be uniform but it will be still be equal to 4 pi okay that's what uh, goes on in theorem tells you so amazing theorem which relates the topology of the surface or whatever the object is here to the geometry so it constrains the geometry in some way and it's extremely robust okay so that was a side remark anyway so i just wanted to make that remark okay so now we get back to the detection here and this is what we have here so here we have examples of uh, the plane k equal to 0 k greater than 0 and k less than 0 so if you take geodesics in this case the geodesics on a plane are straight lines okay so if i take two straight lines i mean take a line and take another straight line okay which starts off parallel okay and this is the connecting vector okay, which i am showing here as you extend this line the size of the connecting vector the length of the connecting vector remains the same oh, <clears throat> so how far however far you extend this these lines will never meet they will keep on following you know in the straight line like this and the reason for that is that k is zero okay that that's what it tells you you are in euclidean geometry and uh, there is a relationship with the euclid's fifth postulate which tells you that <coughs> given a line and a point outside it only one and only one straight line can be drawn parallel to it that's the that's the euclid's fifth postulate and what do we mean by parallel the parallel line means that however far you extend that line it will not intersect it should not intersect the original line so that's what is parallel okay so in case of the plane this is satisfied you would take a plane uh, you would take a line like this it will keep on going to infinity without intersecting this and we we'll, and so when you are doing geometry in a plane it is euclidean geometry but now you come to a sphere okay now what are the geodesics the geodesics the straight lines here are are, are the great circles okay now consider these great circles a particular case like this the longitudes okay which start off at the equator so if you go to the equator this is a, this is a right angle this is a right angle okay over here so they are parallel okay when they start so we are we have satisfied that condition here but the connecting vector keeps on reducing in size until it becomes zero the length of the vector becomes zero so this parallel lines meet it back so what does this mean this means the violation of euclidean geometry okay that is that you have not uh, there is no straight line that can be drawn uh, parallel to a given straight line uh, through a point outside that straight line so you take this straight line for example take a point here or anywhere and try to draw a straight line it will always intersect somewhere okay, on the sphere so in which case that's not parallel so the definition of parallelism is that they should not intersect so so the fifth postulate is violated here so you are not doing euclidean geometry so this is another uh, another what you call evidence that you are not doing euclidean geometry the opposite thing happens here for uh, the hyperboloid okay here also you are not doing euclidean geometry here say for example you take the waist of the uh, this uh, hyperboloid to start with two lines which are parallel to each other this is a right angle this is a right angle if you if you extend this this vectors increase in size okay 
as you go along, the vector increase in size. Here they decrease in size, here they increase in size, and then they don't meet anywhere. So here we have our parallel lines. Okay. So given this line and a point outside, right? We have drawn a line which is parallel here. So then are we in Euclidean geometry? We are we doing Euclidean geometry? No. Because I can slightly bend this line here, this, this particular line here, and <coughs> see what happens to this thing. If you bend this a bit, this will also go to infinity without intersecting. So such a line is also parallel. Okay. So there are infinite number of straight lines which can be drawn parallel to a given straight line through a point outside that straight line. So again, a violation of Euclidean geometry. So these are some interesting facts that uh, how k greater than zero and k less than zero, negative curvature and positive curvature, uh, uh, what do you call manifolds or surfaces behave. Okay, so now we come to gravitational waves. What happens when you have a gravitational wave? Then you have a sinusoidally varying curvature. So your Riemann tensor, the H mu nu, is <coughs> changing sinusoidally. You have, say, a monochromatic wave, uh, which is hitting a particular, uh, <coughs> going through the origin or something like that. And you consider two particles, which are which are spread like this, OK? And this is time. So the connecting vector, what happens to the connecting vector? So the connecting vector, which is there, even if you start it parallel, if k is less than 0 initially, these particles will go away, OK? So they'll go away. This is still negative until they come here when k becomes 0. And when k becomes positive, they start again coming closer together. So what is the kind of uh, situation here? The, <coughs> the particles will keep on oscillating. OK, the, the particles keep oscillating as uh, you uh, <coughs> as, as, as you proceed in time. So this is a monochromatic gravitational wave. And these two particles are maybe sampling maybe some components of the Riemann tensor. So some, but all the Riemann tensor components are varying sinusoidally for a, for a, for a monochromatic gravitational wave. So you will always encounter such a situation. I mean, except that the amplitudes may be different and so on, depending on uh, what particular section you have taken uh, of the <coughs> space time. Okay. So it's important in a way, if you want to maximize your amplitude of the gravitational wave or the signal, then in that case, uh, <coughs> it's good to have detectors which are optimally oriented or something like that. And if you know about the sources and things like that beforehand. So this is this is what they are in two dimensions. But what happens? So but we are in four dimensions. So. Uh, so one thing good about all these geometry critical things is that <coughs> many of these uh, concepts do not change with dimension. Okay, so that uh, you, I mean, like things like a uh, lot of things don't change with dimensions. So whatever, so our intuition, which is quite valid, and uh, we can visualize, you know, two-dimensional objects in three dimensions and so on. That intuition also comes to help, okay, in higher number of dimensions. <clears throat> so many times this happens. Not it may not happen all the time, but uh, it does happen very many times. And so, in in which case, it is good to have this kind of a, uh, a two-dimensional analog uh, to understand what's going on. So this is exactly that, but now in higher dimensions. So we will now consider nearby time like geodesics. So, which are world lines of force-free test particles <coughs> with the reference geodesic <coughs> and four velocity <coughs> u mu. Yes.
Yeah, so we'll consider a nearby time like geodesic uh, with the reference geodesic having four velocity u mu equal to dx mu by d tau and tau is the proper time along the geodesic. Let xi be the correcting vector, uh, then nearby means this is much less than the wavelength. So, what is the leg scale here? The leg scale is the, uh, the wavelength of the gravitational wave. So that is the kind of thing. So for ground-based detectors, this is usually the case uh, because of the fact that the sweet spot, as we say, of the sensitivity curve or the noise curve of these detectors is around 100 hertz to 200 hertz. And the bandwidth ranges actually uh, from uh, tens of hertz, maybe 20, 30 or so on, to kilohertz. Okay? So that's, or maybe a little bit more, but the sweet spot is like 100 Hertz or 200 Hertz, where the detector is most sensitive. And what does that correspond to? What is the wavelength? And the wavelength there is like, see if it is 100 Hertz, the wavelength is like 3000 kilometers. Take the speed of light and uh, uh, do the calculation, okay? So, 100 hertz is 100 of a second. Light will travel something like uh, uh, 3,000 kilometers. If it is 200 hertz, it will be 1,500 kilometers. So, it's order of 1,000 kilometers or more, okay? <clears throat> While your detector, okay, like the LIGO detectors, are a few kilometers. Three, four, Virgo is three, the LIGO is four, and so on. So there are four kilometer detectors. So they are much smaller. So xi, if you look at it, R is much smaller than uh, lambda GW. So that's why you can use the geodesic deviation equation. And the thing is that this geodesic deviation is in fact an approximation in a way. I mean, when you are doing geodesic deviation, you talk of nearby geodesics, okay? So what does one mean nearby? Nearby is a, in fact, a comparison, okay? Comparison of two lengths, okay? So the connecting vector, okay? The size of the connecting vector has to be small in some way. But small compared to what, okay? Small compared to the curvature of the space type, okay? So in this case, if you went back to the sphere, the curvature is, even by one over r square, okay, or so that defines the scale to be the radius of the sphere. So if you take the geodesics nearby, then uh, you are satisfying so much less than r if you take the distance between the geodesics. Then uh, that, in fact, is uh, that is nearby. In case of LIGO detectors and all that, again it's nearby because two test particles which are there, which are moving around the world lines, moving means they're stationary there in space in a way, but they move in time, they extend in time. Uh, even if they are placed like four kilometers apart, the Zaya is Zaya raised to half is just four kilometers, while Lambda GW is order of thousand kilometers or order of that. Even if you go to a kilohertz, Lambda GW is still 300 kilometers. Okay? So you are well within the thing and you can use this geodesic deviation equation for uh, calculating the response of a LIGO detector or the Virgo detector or the ground-based detectors. And this is called the long wavelength limit, LWL in short. And it is appropriate as I see, said for ground-based detectors. Let xi alpha be the correct, so now I'm going to just state the uh, this geodesic derivation equation in n dimensions. So let xi alpha be the connecting vector connecting the points on the geodesics at the same Sanjeev, this is Sriram. Uh, I have a question regarding the previous slide. Is, have you assumed xi i to be a space-like vector? 
yes. Yes. Okay. It is uh, okay. It is orthogonal to the word line. Right. So, and I had another question. It is you said that uh, the the magnitude of the xi yeah. should be much smaller than the curvature of space time for okay. this geodesic decoy. What will be the curvature associated with uh, plane wave gravitational wave? So that is the lambda GW. Okay. So that gives a length scale. So the curvature will be like one over lambda square or something. I understand. Thank you. Yeah, you can see that from the you know if you look at that within the ex expression. Uh, let me go back. Uh, no, where is it? Uh, no, where is it? Uh, ah, here. Okay. Our mu nu this thing. This is the this is the thing which is there. Uh, H mu nu alpha mu and so on here. So this is the this you throw out this gamma square terms. If this H mu nu or the wave, then this would be k square. E, H mu nu H alpha nu, if you write equal to something times e to the i k mu x mu, for example, then uh, this will give you a factor of k square outside this. But what is k? K is just 2 pi by lambda. I understand. So you get lambda square term in the denominator. And then you get the, which gives you the length scale for the curvature. So that's how you determine the length scale for the gravitational wave. So it is lambda GW basically. So that determines the, it can't be anything else. The gravitational wave doesn't have any other. Uh, what do you call it? Scale. scale. Yeah, scale. there is no other scale in the thing. It is. There is, uh, there is another question. Yeah. Sumit, uh, uh, I am not able to unmute you, uh, Sumit. Uh, oh, okay. Just give me a minute, maybe. Ah, yeah. you have been unmuted. Can you go ahead and ask your questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, you said that this xi mu, uh, can you go back? Yeah, uh, the previous slide 32. I mean, yeah. So you said that the xi mu is orthogonal to the world line u, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. But is this, a, is this a, I mean, additional constraint because we require the deviation vector to be Li transported along this uh, four velocity? But really, you don't need to be exactly orthogonal, but you can take it to be orthogonal. Okay. Okay. So, so that is just a choice that you are able to make. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the arithmetic vector need not be because you can choose your parameterizations differently, and uh, how do you choose tau here and tau there and so on? You know, for the two particles which are going, you know, it's at the same tau, but one can always change those parameterizations. Okay. There's a, some freedom there. So, uh, so the so it's you don't need to be i i i use orthogonal because that was much simpler as uh, this thing i mean uh, what do you call it, it gives you uh, what do you call it uh, it is a more simple example that's all it doesn't have to be all right or yeah thank, thank you yeah there are no other questions at this stage Sanjay. Yeah. So let xi alpha be the connecting vector connecting points on the geodesic so tau. The geodesic equation is this. This is the geodesic equation. D2 xi alpha by d tau square is equal to r alpha beta the Riemann tensor. Uh, U alpha u nu. This is the four velocity of the geodesics times i beta, which is the connecting vector. The deviation of the geodesic changes. Uh, you know, measures the curvature of the space time because of this thing. So you can remember, do that. Remember that GWR ripples in the curvature of space time. So by monitoring the. <coughs> can you hear me? There's a lot of noise in this plane. You know what they are doing. Can you yeah, hear? We are able to hear you. Yeah, yeah, Sanjay. I can't hear anything. <coughs> Anyway, huh, here, okay. So by monitoring the changes in xi mu, xi alpha, we can measure and detect the GW. 
So in linearized theory, this is the case here. If, if you go to the, what happened here? If you go to the rest frame of the reference the geodesic, then thus in the geodesic division equation, we just require all R alpha zero zero beta. <clears throat> so what we are doing is now <coughs> choosing uh, u mu to be one zero zero zero. So that's what we have done here. And this is the thing. And we'll try to now solve this equation, okay, for two particles, okay, for a wave. So here it is. So R alpha zero zero beta is equal to this. Right now the zero because zeros come because I uh, put uh, u mu equal to one zero zero zero. In the TT gauge we have h alpha zero equal to zero, and hence we get <coughs> this equal to just h alpha beta zero zero. There's only one component which remains here. Rest of the things that you see are all zero in this thing. So it makes so this is the this is the advantage of the TT gauge as you can see here. Immediately three terms are gone. Okay, in this gauge. So we have chosen the TT gauge. And the geodesic equation becomes this d2 xi alpha by d tau square equal to this xi beta. Okay, so this is the kind of equation you have. And since uh, this is just slow motion, I mean, the particles are hardly moving, even for a, if you take 10 to the minus 21, <coughs> they move, in fact, microscopically. So, so the velocities are extremely low okay, in these things. <clears throat> so alpha changes only over the space indices. And what you get is only this. Here, you can write d2 xi by dt square equal to uh, half d, d2 dhik uh, by dt square. Maybe there will be a 2 there. Uh, xi k. Okay. So this is the equation we have to solve with initial conditions. So now we'll do this for a circular ring of particles. Now, why do we choose a circular ring? Because this is a tensor field. It's more complicated than a charge, okay? For on, suppose you are calculating the effect of electromagnetic wave on a charge. One charge sitting in one place is enough. The charge will oscillate and so on. Here, uh, <coughs> this is a, there are two reasons for this is that you can't measure any gravitational wave with just one particle. Because always the reason is because of the equivalence principle. You can you can just go to the frame of that particle and just get, a, get rid of the acceleration. So one with one particle, you can simply not cannot measure a gravitational wave. In fact, you cannot measure any gravity at all, okay, with, uh, with a single point. What you need is several particle particles which are nearby, okay. So consider a ring of test particles in the xy plane with the radius unity. Let a wave traveling in the z direction be incident upon the ring. We will investigate how the ring is deformed because of the wave. Let us consider one polarization h plus t equal to uh, h naught cos omega t, okay, for simplicity, okay. And if you can do this, the same thing can be done for h cross. And then any general combination will be a linear combination of H plus and H cross, any general wave, probably a phase difference or something. So we'll take an undeformed state of the ring, take the size of the ring to be unit in uh, radius. So the radius of the ring is unity, one. So undeformed state is xi is equal to xi is zero. So you have a ring of particles, and xi x zero is cos phi, xi y zero is sine phi. Okay, and the deformed state, which I write here, is xi equal to xi zero plus delta xi of t. So then, putting back into this equation, this part of course, you know, nothing happens to the, the derivative kills this particular xi zero, and you get this equal to this kind of thing here. Yeah, uh, over there. So then, but then we assume now here that the HIK is extremely small. Okay. So the effect on the test particles is extremely small. So delta xi is much, much smaller 
then psyche, okay. The general psyche, psyche zero, which is there. So we are already anticipating this in a way, okay. This is generally what we do in physics. And uh, <laughs> it's sort of, it used to trouble me a lot in the old days when I switched from mathematics to physics. But uh, it seems to work, so it is okay. <laughs> And I started doing my PhD. <clears throat> so <clears throat> half of this, uh, I don't understand why I did not put that thing. Zyke zero is what you have here. So the solution to this is basically this, which comes out here. Uh, I have forgotten to put the squares in the thing actually for some reason. Anyway. So this is equal to this, and then delta zaya is just half of h i k zai k zero. So this is a solution with initial conditions. Initial condition is that the particle is at rest or wherever it is there, and the and with velocity zero. Then if you integrate this equation, and uh, you will get this kind of a solution uh, with. Uh, with those initial conditions. So now the plus polarization is hxx minus hyy equal to h plus t. So you get delta xi x now you calculate. Okay. So well, what is plus polarization? If you see it was hxx minus hyy is uh, h plus t. So uh, delta xi x, I am a little bit running slow, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe I'll. You uh, have about you have about seven eight minutes left for today's lecture. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll have less time tomorrow then. But anyway, that's okay. I might speed up a bit, but I don't want to speed up here. That's why I should have speeded up in the beginning. So delta xi x is half h x x xi x zero, half h plus xi x zero. So this is. And delta xi x is x here, and there's only x component here. Okay. So that multiplies, so there was a sum over here, over k. So only x will be, occur here. So it will be hxx is just h plus t. Xi x0 is <coughs> half h naught cos omega t cos phi. <coughs> well, delta xi y with half h y y, xi y0. Which is minus half, as you can see from here, h plus t psi y zero, which is minus half h naught cos omega t sine phi. So this gives you add to the original. These are the changes. Okay, how much the particles move along the <coughs> in the x y plane. Okay, and how much the psi naught. <coughs> Psi vector is changed. So you must add it to that. So psi x becomes psi x zero plus delta psi x is one plus half h naught cos omega t cos phi psi y equal to psi y zero plus delta psi y equal to one minus h naught cos omega t uh, sine phi. And as you can see, this is just an uh, equation of an ellipse, which is an ellipse at each fixed t. Okay. So as you can see here, this omega t is, uh, equal, I mean, equal to zero or something like that. Then, then you will have this. Uh, uh, this you'll, you'll get this equal to an ellipse with uh, you'll get a, get an ellipse which keeps on oscillating, okay? And uh, oscillations is along the semi major and semi minor axis, which are along the x y axis, which is an ellipse at each fixed t over here. Similar calculation can be done. So this is how it looks. 
and you can do the same kind of calculations for h cross t also i don't know whether uh, uh, mukesh will have time to do the other thing that is for h cross t but it is uh, very similar to that but you will have to rotate your uh, frame the high x and high y <coughs> have to be rotated by 45 degrees and you will get again an ellipse uh, in the normal form so the deformation of uh, the ring of test particles looks like this so this is called the plus so when it is zero the phase the phase is on the top here the circle for the plus polarization this becomes zero here so what we have is a wave which is traveling in the z direction going into the plane okay in the plane of the wave plane of the whatever laptop or plane of the screen and this circle becomes the ellipse which looks like this for pi by 2 for pi it becomes zero uh, again a circle then back into a ellipse with the semi major and semi minor axis interchange and this in fact will allow us to now use this principle for detection because if you now place three particles one reference particle here then one particle here and one particle there then if you monitor the distances with some lasers or whatever then the path difference will measure for you the gravitational wave okay so effect of a gravitational wave or the presence of the gravitational wave with cross what happens is the circle goes into an ellipse but ellipse is at 45 degrees again a circle but again at 45 degrees and a general uh, wave is a linear combination of it just like in electrodynamics <coughs> there you have vx and ey you uh, uh, you have you can add two polar uh, <coughs> i mean the two amplitudes of the polarization with a phase difference and that will give you a linear uh, they'll give you a general uh, electromagnetic wave the same thing is true here you take one with the h plus one with h cross and if you add the two of them together with the phase difference then that would be a, that's a general uh, 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 general plane gravitational wave so just to show you how the things are the schematic of an interferometer is here so this is what happens here uh, you have the laser this is the photo detector these are the two masses so this is the ring the whole ring is this okay the ring of particles is here okay then this mirror moves closer that mirror moves away in uh, one part of the ring then the rest phi phase this moves closer that moves away and that will produce a fringe shift or uh, changes of flux of light on the photo detector which you measure okay at the photo detector but the whole uh, <coughs> the catch is this is minute okay so that's the problem of detecting gravitational waves you are trying to detect things at the level of h of 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 21 and so on so this ring which is shown here is highly exaggerated it changes by one part in 10 to the 21 or 22 or something like that okay. so uh, there are a whole lot of uh, the experimentalists have to do a lot of things in order to get rid of noises and things like that in order to detect the gravitational wave here's the picture of the ligo livingston interferometer detector in louisiana okay there are two of these detectors in the us two ligos one is in Hanford, which is on the north uh, west okay, of US. The other one is on the southeast. Okay, so that's the those are the that's the kind of thing. Yeah, I think I'll stop here because the next thing is the response which I'll discuss, but then that I'll do tomorrow. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, let me see if there are questions. 
uh, participants, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We should be able to uh, unmute you. Any questions or leave a message in the question and answer or the chat box as is convenient for you. Do you have any questions for Professor Durendra? I don't see any hands raised, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, um, they seem. Uh, 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 is it you know, too? Uh, I mean, is it too, too easy or too? I don't know what's the. <laughs> I think. Uh, um, uh, I think it is fine. I believe they are following. I presume, Sanjeev. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have a mixture of students, I believe. Uh, so uh, I believe it implies they are following. Uh, so then actually, I don't know. Maybe what you can do is that you can slightly speed up tomorrow if needed, so that you can uh, complete the target you have set for yourself. I, uh, I mean, I don't think I have to speed up. So, okay, okay, okay. So I think the, the speed is okay. And, All right. Uh, Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, there is one. Uh, okay, there is. Uh, there is. Just let me see. Can the perturbate? No, there are no questions actually. That's. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Okay. okay. 